Well, thanks everybody for coming out today to hear me talk about my attempt at quantifying macroalgae in the Kokusahashi estuary. Uh, so as many of you have probably seen or maybe have heard about, um, blooms of macroalgae have be been becoming an increasing problem in our area. Um, and as these blooms of algae increase in frequency, extent, and biomass, they pose a really significant threat to our um, ecosystems in Sanibel. And in addition to that, um, when these stinking and unsightly accumulations wash up on beaches, they can really impact the local economy. Um, they wash up there and they decompose, chasing away the residents and the tourists alike. Um, so, in my presentation today, um, I'm going to be talking to you about this project that I did. My goal uh, was to quantify the regional owl abundance um, and species assemblage and attempt to relate those parameters to distance from the Kalusahashi River itself. So to give you an introduction um, to macroalgae, they can look a little bit like flowering plants, but um, they lack the true roots, stems, leaves, and um, vascular structure that flowering land plants have. They're defined as photosynthetic, non-vascular plants that contain chlorophyll A and have simple reproductive structures. Um, a lot of algaes are um, single-celled organisms, but seaweeds, as they're sometimes called, are simply large macroscopic versions of these organisms, hence the name macroalgae. Uh, they're generally divided up into three broad classifications based on their pigmentation. So that's red algae, green algae, and brown. Up there we have a picture of um, the red algae, um, Grassalaria. We have the very bright, toxic-looking Ovalectuca green algae and some sargassum as an example of brown. And specifically today, I'm going to be talking to you about drift macroalgae. So most seaweeds are attached by, to the substrate um, by rhizoids or holdfasts. You can see in that picture there um, some algae growing off of an oyster shell. But a lot of the times, they'll be broken loose by natural phenomena like waves, currents, storms. Um, so then they're broken loose and they drift around in the water. And sometimes they'll undergo changes in morphology. They might become more fleshy or filamentous, um, maybe undergo some increased branching. And they'll also continue to grow and get bigger through vegetative fragmentation. And often the blooms of macroalgae that you see off of Sanibel are in these accumulated masses that contain multiple species. So despite all their negative attention, the, the stress algae is actually a pretty important component of healthy marine ecosystems, especially uh, seagrass beds. As all of us know, seagrass beds are important habitats. Um, they're an essential nursery for fisheries and provide all kinds of ecosystem services. So we definitely value seagrass. And this drift algae is an essential component of those ecosystems as well. Um, they provide high levels of primary productivity um, which in many cases can rival that of seagrasses. They also contributed, contribute to the dissolved organic carbon pool, and when they die, they contribute to the detritus pool. So basically, other organisms can feed on that, and that carbon can move up trophic levels and um, contribute to the ecosystem. And they also provide pretty essential services for small fish and invertebrates. Uh, they provide them with food, so grazers can use them as a food source. They could also be a refuge from predators, and those little organisms can also hide in there and actually get dispersed and move around as the drift algae is distributed throughout the estuary. Now, despite these beneficial services, the overabundance of macroalgae can have severe impacts on the marine system. So a big one is when this algae respires and decomposes at night, it uses up a lot of oxygen in the water. So that can lead to hypoxia or a dead zone that we often hear about, and those are bad things. They Nothing can live in a, in a place that has no oxygen. Um, the accumulations can also physically block light from reaching seagrass at the bottom of the water column. Um, so obviously, uh, a lack of seagrass is, is worse than the um, sometimes beneficial services that uh, drift algae can provide. And of course, the, the final example of these impacts are the nuisance accumulations that wash up on beaches. That's a pretty dramatic example there. Someone like had to shovel the sidewalk to, to get through the algae. So it, it decomposes up on the beach, and it smells bad, and it looks bad, and nobody likes it. 
Uh, so a lot of times when we hear the phrase harmful algal blooms, um, they tend to uh, be used to describe um, periodic um, episodic increases in the abundance of um, microalgal organisms um, that often have direct chemical-based toxic effects on either human or animal health. Um, both microalgal and macroalgal blooms can have intensive consequences but microalgal effects tend to be um, direct and narrowly focused, um, while macroalgae blooms are more indirect and extensive. Um, so these macroalgal blooms tend to last longer, and they have wide-range impacts that can fundamentally alter marine systems. So the one we're familiar with around here in terms of microalgal blooms is the red tide, which is caused by crena, crenia brevis. Um, but these, these macroalgal blooms don't cause the same kinds of consequences, but they can still be very harmful. Um, so most often, um, seagrasses are light limited in estuarine systems, but algae are uh, nutrient limited. So um, when there are increases in nutrient loading, this leads to the overproduction of algae. Um, macroalgae blooms can therefore be viewed as an indicator of pollution or eutrophication, which is the term um, that we use to describe um, excess nutrients usually coming from um, runoff. Um, and typically um, in estuarine systems, uh, the limiting nutrient is nitrogen for algae blooms. Um, in freshwater systems, it tends to be phosphorus, but most of the time um, in our estuary, we're looking at um, nitrogen loading. Um, from eutrophication that's fueling these blooms. So this is a worldwide phenomenon. I drew up a couple examples here. Um, one in, in Wackwood Bay, Massachusetts, with these uh, red and green algae Cladophora and grass claria, has been around for multiple decades now, so it kind of speaks to the uh, persistence of these kinds of blooms. Um, in Bermuda, the Cladophora mats that have formed there, the stillamentous green algae forms these mats that are two to 100 centimeters thick that cover tens to hundreds of acres there. Um, another famous one is Oval Lactuca, the green tides in the Venice Lagoon and French coast. And then one that we probably all remember was this huge bloom of Enteromorpha that um, caused big problems at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. That's one of the biggest ones in history. So around here, what's driving our macroalgal production? Um, if we look at the way uh, flows used to happen in this area. We had this historical wetland um, where Lake Okeechobee would flow and drain into the Everglades, and the Caloosahatchee River there was disconnected, and we had a much smaller estuary. Um, so we also had frequent tidal flushing of oligotrophic salty water from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, our watershed was smaller, and there was more filtration from um, land plants. The area was less developed. Um, so there was more absorption by the land, and um, in addition, there were fewer nutrients and particulates entering our estuary in the first place. Our current flows are quite different. Um, there now is a connection between the Caloosahatchee and Lake Okeechobee, and where the land is more developed, there's a lot more urban and agricultural runoff, and we frequently get these um, extensive releases of high nutrient water um, coming from Lake Okeechobee. So that's what's that's what we think is driving our um, macroalgae blooms that we're seeing increase in abundance. So now getting to my research. Um, the main questions I wanted to ask is, how is macroalgae distributed in this estuary? And I wanted to know how the biomass and abundance is related to the distance from the river. And I also wanted to start asking which species make up the drift algae assemblages in Sanibel. And I wanted to do all of this using a novel sampling method. I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, but our hypothesis was that the drift macroalgae would have the highest biomass near the mouth of the river because of those increased nutrient loads that are coming from all that fresh water that's flushed out of there. So to give you a context for our, um, our study sites, we focused, this is pulled directly from the old recon website. So these are our recon sites, which provide um, pretty handy way to look at local water quality parameters. Um, so our, this study focused um, near the regions of Shell Point, Tarpon Bay, McIntyre Creek, and Redfish Pass. We weren't sampling further up the river. We didn't go past the causeway. So we were constricted within um, those Sanibel waters. 
this graph here is showing you um, the average daily salinities in the general um, time period of when this study took place. So that's, um, we included two months there, the first of December to the last day of January. Um, and since we only focused really on four parts of the recon sites, these were our four sites. Um, and you can see that uh, the salinities aren't really that different between those. Um, further up at salinity um, in Beautiful Island and Fort Myers, you get lower salinities because it's further up the river, the water is fresher. Um, but you do get this general salinity gradient as you move away from the river. That shell point um, recon station can reach pretty fresh um, salinities of 0 to 10 PSU, so you know pretty much fresh water. Redfish Pass, which is up in Pine Island Sound, is generally more consistent between 29 and 35, 35 being the um, average PSU of seawater. But you can see for our study period, um, salinities really weren't that different. There is a bit of a gradient there, but generally pretty much the same. Uh, looking at temperature, um, even more similar um, across our sites during the study period. Um, waters around here can range from 15 to 33 degrees Celsius annually. You do have a bit of a you have a bit of a seasonal variation there, with summer averages being 30, winter averages being 25. You can see the waters were a bit cold during this study since it was the first week of January. So now going into my methods, we sampled on four different dates, um, ranging from the 9th of January to the 24th. That was over four days. We had 15 sites. At each site, we would conduct three trawls. Each one was 30 seconds. And we were, would record our line using a Trimble GPS so that we could get our exact position coordinates into GIS, which is what this plot here is showing you. Different colors represent our different trawling bays. And since it's kind of hard to see our three separate trawls, we can zoom in a little bit. And here you can actually see the lines. You see Eric doesn't really drive that straight. Um, <laughs> you'll notice most of them have three, but there's one there that has four. Sometimes we had to redo a trawl. So, but that's those are our exact tracks that you're looking at there. So now going into this novel sampling method, we use an otter trawl and this <laughs> newly constructed volumetric chamber method to quantify algae. So what we did was we towed this otter trawl behind a boat. This is a standard gear used for fish trawling. Um, we had a 15 millimeter mesh size. It's called an otter trawl because of the otter boards on either side that keep the net upright. You've got floats on the top of the mouth and chain on the bottom. And the goal is to sweep along the bottom and get everything into your net. So that includes fish and whatever algae is in the area. So we would tow behind our boat for 30 seconds, pull everything in. Sometimes we had an entire net full of algae. So it could take us a few hours to get all of it in the boat. So we would pull it in, do the opposite of most studies. We would throw all the fish back <laughs> and sort all the algae out. Then we would prepare our volumetric chamber. So you can see a large flexible bucket on the outside there and a smaller one on the inside, which we would fill all the way to the brim with water. And then you place the, the macroalgae in there. And as it spills out over the top, you get the exact volume displacement of the algae you put in. And then you take that water from the flexible bucket, use it to pour the volume into a flask to measure it, and you get your volume displacement. So you could you essentially measure the entire volume of algae you pulled up in each trawl. So depending on how much algae you get, that can take a long time. So now to standardize our samples across um, all of our different sites, uh, we took a subsample to attain a gram dry weight per meter squared of algae. This will allow us to compare our results to other studies and it'll standardize it for us. So we obtained a subsample from each trawl, um, one trawl per site. Um, we would then measure that subsample volume back in the lab and we would sort the algae all the way down to genus and species, which isn't always an easy thing to do. Sometimes you have to cross section them to figure out what they are. Um, measure things under a microscope. Um, and then each species was placed in a foil pack and measured and then dried. And then you measure the after weight and you determine your dry weight. So going into math a little bit here, I apologize. Um, it's actually pretty simple though, I, I swear. So we're going off the basic assumption that a subsample weight over a subsample volume will be equal to the trawl weight over the trawl volume. 
So using that proportion, you can get the trawl weight by multiplying the subsample weight by the trawl volume divided by the subsample volume, and you'll have your total grams of your trawl weight. You divide that weight by the trawl area. To get the trawl area, you take um, the trawl distance in meters by the trawl width, which we measured as 4.15 meters. Using all that, you get your grams dry weight per meter squared. And that allows us to actually analyze our results and compare them to each other. So now moving into the results. Um, here you see a graph divided in two. Uh, along the x-axis at the bottom, you have all of our sites. Um, the ones on the left are the closest to the river mouth. The ones on the right are the furthest away. So you see Tween Waters and South Seas down there. Those are up in Fun Island Sound. Poonarasa Creek, Big Island, Merwin, those are near the river mouth. So what we expected to see was big, high biomass near the river trailing off as you got into Pine Island Sound. And you can see that Pine Island Sound has lower biomass, but the pattern isn't really as clear as we were expecting. Um, the, tr the top half there is the raw numbers, and the bottom half is truncated, so you can see the, the more minor patterns a little bit more clearly. You can see a bit of a change as you move away from the river, but it's maybe not as pretty as we had been hoping. So to get into that a little bit more, we use a linear regression to, um, to analyze that pattern. So the first graph I'm going to show you here is all of our site's raw data. Um, so that V0 represents um, the y-intercept, V1 represents the slope of the regression line you see on the screen, and the R-squared um, describes how well the line is fitting the data. So this first one is all the sites you don't see much of a negative slope on that line. And it's also not a very good fit to the data because the data is all over the place. So if we remove that big outlier, Duffy Creek, which is the second line here on the table, you see that the slope is more negative, but the fit still isn't that great. You, um, the best you can get for an R-squared is 1. And generally, um, 0.5 would be a pretty good fit to the data. Um, but 0 0.09 is definitely still not a very good fit. So if we remove the other two outliers, you get a better fit to the data, but the negative slope still isn't that great. Um, so it's a little hard to say whether um, you can really talk about a pattern of more biomass near the river and less away from it. So just to look at this graphically in a way that might make a little bit more sense, this is using GIS to assign hotspot values to the trawl um, biomass that we were getting. Um, the red spots represent biomasses between 144 to 351 grams dry weight per meter squared. That's, that's a lot. Um, and then of the blue sites, uh, blue spots represent 0 to 0.7. So you can see Pine Island Sound has more blue and green, and you see more red and yellow close to the river, but then you have that little back bay there <laughs> that has very, very high biomass. Um, so this next graph is simply changing the symbology of our tracks in ArcGIS um, to assign proportional widths um, to each trial line based on the grams dry weight per meter squared. Um, so you can see some, some large spots near the river mouth, but there's something going on in that, in that back bay there. That's a really big spot that's pretty much crowding everything else out. Um, so going into the species results of um, these trawls, what you'll notice from this table, this is all the species we found. We found a total of 32. Um, there were a few that were dominant. Um, up at the top is Grasslaria tigbahi, found at 12 sites, 229 grams dry weight per meter squared total. That uh, top picture is uh, Grasslaria tigbahi. Um, next most abundant was Hypnia spinella. That's the middle one there. And then finally, Acanthophora specifera, which is the bottom one, has got those little kind of spikes that allow it to, to cling to things. Um, and Hypnia and Acanthophora were found at all of our sites. Um, so you'll see that there's those top species that are kind of dominating, and then a lot more rare species that are only found at a few sites in pretty low biomass. So if we want to ask the question, do algal assemblages differ between different regions? Um, 
I decided to divide up um, our results into some different areas to help with the analysis a little bit. So up here we have a creek site. Unfortunately, we only sampled there one time. Um, we have our river mouth sites. We have back bays in there. And then Pine Island sound sites. And remember these colors because I'm going to stick with those that color coding for the rest of the presentation. Um, so how do we ask the question or find the answer to the question? Do algal assemblages differ between regions? We use an anosim, which is analysis of similarities. Um, this is all using the primer statistical package. Um, it's an analog of a one-way ANOVA, which is an analysis of variance test. And basically what it does is it tests the null hypothesis that there are no assemblage differences between groups of samples as specified by levels of a single factor. That factor we're going to use is going to be the, the regions that I just showed you on that last slide. So to do this, we have to use a resemblance matrix. Um, the resemblance matrix is formed by first um, square root transforming the data that downweights the um, influence of the dominant species and it increases the importance of rare species in the analysis. And then what you do is you run this Bray Curtis resemblance um, to calculate the dissimilarity between samples. I know that sounds complicated and this result looks kind of complicated, but all you really need to worry about are those two numbers there. So this graph shows the um, distribution of Rs that you would expect if the null hypothesis were true. You would expect to get those R, zero, R values around zero, but our R value is all the way out here at 0.7. So that is at a significant level, and we can reject our null hypothesis and conclude that different species assemblages occur at different sites. So do they differ? Yes, they do. And then we can ask the question, but how? And we can analyze that using Primer also. So this is a cool tool in Primer called a non-metric multidimensional scaling, and it's a 2D ordination um, that uses those arbitrary distances that were calculated from the Bray Curtis similarity index um, to use those differences to put things in a two dimensional space to tell you how things are related. So, these are the results. Things that are closer together represent areas that are more similar, and things that are farther apart are more different from each other. So, you can see that there's a clustering going on. You see those Pine Island sound sites off to the right. Um, you see Punarasa Creek, it's kind of by itself down there on the bottom, and you see the river mouth sites clustering, a little more confusing with the back bay results there. Um, you can add actual percentages to tell you how different or similar those are. You can see all the sites are at least 20% similar, um, with certain sites a little bit more similar in the 40% range. Um, not many 60% similar, but a bunch of those riv river mouth sites are. So now we can look at individual species compositions um, driving these differences in assemblages. Um, so we can use the SIMPR routine, um, SIMPR stands for similarity percentages, um, to tell you the contribution of variables to the similarity or dissimilarity that we saw on that last slide. So this um, routine examines the role of individual species either contributing to the separation between two groups of samples or contributing to their similarity, their closeness within a group. So these are the results of um, simple similarities. We have um, only three up here. You'll notice Creek isn't there. We only had one um, sample at that site, so you can't compare it to itself. Um, but we see river mouth is the most similar, 53% similarity. And the species that's massively dominating um, the contribution of that similarity is Grassleria tigbahi, our most abundant species in this survey. Um, the other two most dominant species are also contributing, but tigbahi is, is making up the vast proportion of that. Um, in the back bay, the samples are less similar to each other, still 38% similar. And we see that acanthophora and hypnia are driving those different, those similarities a little bit more. And finally, in Pine Island Sound, you'll notice those two species on the top there are actually seagrass species. So we did collect seagrass in our trawls, but that was kind of an incidental collection. It's not like we were targeting seagrass, it just ended up in some of our trawls, but we still quantified it. So you'll see there that um, the Pine Island Sound assemblages are, are similar to each other because of the presence of those seagrass in those samples. So that's, that's kind of interesting. So now we can look at the dissimilarities. 
Um, the color coding still represents the, the same thing that it did before. Um, groups of river mouth and back bay are um, fairly dissimilar, um, driven by the presence or absence of tigvahi, which was more present in river mouth and then hypnia and a different species of grasslaria in the back bay sites. Uh, if we look at the differences between river mouth and Pine Island Sound, again, you see those two algae um, driving the difference for river mouth and the presence of the seagrass, Syringodium, um, differentiating Pine Island Sound. Now, if we look at the creek sites, we can do this now since we have something to compare that one site to. Um, you'll see that the creek and back bay sites are very different from each other. You have an 84% dissimilarity there. And that's really being driven by the presence of Ketomorpha gracilis in those creek sites. You'll see a very similar result for Pine Island Sound in the creek. Um, that presence of Ketomorpha is, is really making up the difference for the creek site. So just to review all of that, because I know it's confusing. Um, the creek site is distinguished by the presence of Ketomorpha gracilis. And that makes sense because what we found at the site were these dreadlock-like mats of filamentous algae. This is the only place we found it. Um, and that's pretty much the species that was making up those, um, those assemblages there. Then at these two sites, we see these dominant opportunistic species with more Gracilaria at the river sites and more Hypnia and Acanthophora at the back bay sites. And then finally, um, Pine Island Sound, characterized by low algal biomass and a higher proportion of seagrass species in our samples. So getting into the final conclusions, our original hypothesis, again, just to remind you, was that drift macroalgae will have the highest biomass near the mouth of the river due to that increased nutrient loading. We didn't really prove that hypothesis, but we didn't really prove the null that there's no patterns either. Um, we did find that there's no significant correlation between algal biomass and distance from the river. Um, there are those, those weird things happening in back bays that we can't really answer the question as to what's going on there yet. Um, we can see that there are regional differences in algal assemblage. We saw those results on the last slide there, um, that there's different species driving um, those similarities and differences in um, various regions of this estuary. Um, just to compare this to some previous studies, um, you'll see that all these studies here, we have some from the East Coast, some from the West Coast, some local. You'll see that they have in common um, a pretty diverse taxa of 63 species, 48 different species. Um, we have pretty diverse algal assemblages here, probably because of our, our tropical location. Um, on the east coast, you'll, you'll see a range of mean biomasses that were found. Um, some are lower, 1.7 to 8.7. Some are higher, 164. Um, in Biscayne Bay, which is in the southeast, we, where you see um, lower freshwater inputs, the algal biomasses are consistently lower than 100 grams of dry weight per meter squared. Um, in this region, um, a thesis by Brown in 2001 in Tarpon Bay found only 0.1 to 9.5. That's pretty low. But then a uh, more recent study done by Rick <laughs> in Sanibel um, showed pretty high um, mean biomasses between 58 and 343 grams dry weight. The highest you'll see is um, on the west coast in Hillsborough Bay in the um, Tampa Bay region, where there were um, mean biomasses reaching 930 grams dry weight per meter squared. So that's, that's definitely a lot, but they actually have a bit of a success story up there. Um, since they've made water quality improvements in that area, they have taken their algae biomass down um, from 100 grams dry weight per meter squared um, to only a few milligrams per meter squared. And they've also seen um, an increase in seagrass coverage by a factor of 270. So seagrass has really come back from their reduction of nutrients and their um, reduction of macroalgae. Um, if we look at some of the species found in other studies, um, Dawes in 2004, and in, in a review um, and a report to the city of Sanibel, um, determined that Florida drift taxes usually contain species like Rasslaria, Hypnia, Chondria, Ancophora. Those are all things that were found in this study. And these dominant species are all known to have high tolerances for different ranges of light, temperature, and salinity. So it makes sense that they would do well in a range of conditions. Um, that thesis from 2001 um, looked at daily growth rates, BGR, 
and found that these species are different than the species that I found, but they're still the same genus. Hypnia, Grassler, Akinbophora had daily growth rates between 2 to 8%. Um, so basically, a daily growth rate of more than 4% um, represents a doubling period of about 20 days. So they can increase their biomass really quickly. Um, so that makes the high abundances that we found in this study relatively feasible. So some final thoughts here. Even though a variety of factors affect macroalgae blooms, you can have different um, nutrient loadings, different water residence times, water flow, various surrounding shorelines, different effects from grazers. They, we found um, that our mean biomass and general species composition were consistent with results found in other studies um, in Florida estuaries. And right now it's difficult to explain why we see these assemblages and patterns of abundance without further information. So to talk about some of our, our future directions here, an important conclusion from all of this is that our volumetric chamber method was relatively effective and pretty efficient. Some uh, trawls took longer than others, but we were able to get a lot of information over the course of four days. Um, these are two of our lovely volunteers here helping out with work. Um, but there's a lot of potential with future studies from, from what was done here. Um, definitely a, a lot of um, potential for temporal studies. You can look at differences over different seasons, across years. Um, basically, the more data you would collect on this, the more potential there would be. You could also conduct um, rapid response surveys. You know, if someone calls about algae washing up on the beach, you can go out and survey relatively quickly um, algae that's in the water. You could also conduct simultaneous seagrass surveys to see how seagrass um, composition or biomass is changing at the same time as the algae. And another really useful thing to do would be to measure um, algae in conjunction with environmental variables. Um, sediment grain size or sediment silt composition could tell you about water residence times or how flow is moving, and that could give clues as to why maybe that algae is going into back bays. Um, you could also do a more thorough salinity and temperature analysis, correlate those two things, maybe figure out more about those patterns. Um, you could also uh, do atomic composition or stable isotope um, studies on the algae itself to figure out if it's nutrient limited, where, it's nutri where it might be obtaining its nutrients from, and that could help to tell us why the algae is growing. Um, another important future direction to consider is the this method could be very suitable for use by other agencies. Um, we have the, the state that does regular fish trawls. They already have the trawl on their boat, and they could easily um, quantify algae if they, if they wanted to. At least our, uh, our study would suggest that. All right, to finish up, um, I'd like to give a few shout outs. So first off, I have to thank SCCF and everyone at SCS, SCCF, um, and also all of our wonderful donors. Um, it's a great internship program that, that you guys have, and it's, it's been really enjoyable. Um, my volunteers that helped me on my surveys, I have two Ricks and my one Katie. Katie and I got really good with that trawl. Um, <laughs> we had a good time out there. She was, she was ready to go out again when I talked to her last time. Um, and then I, I have to thank everyone at the Marine Lab, Eric, Rick, Mark, AJ, Jeff, and Ashley. I've got creepy pictures of almost everyone in the field. Except Ashley, we mostly got oysters together, but we should be glad we didn't take any pictures of that. <laughs> um, especially have to thank Eric, um, because he really mentored me through this project and helped me sort out my thoughts, do the analysis. Um, it's been a real privilege working with you guys and getting to know you. So with that, I will take any questions. <laughs> Maybe I missed it, but I'd like to know where Duffy Creek is. Duffy Creek is that back bay that had like the, the red hot spot. Okay. Yeah. Off of Sanibel? In the Mackenzie. refuge. It's north of that. Yeah. It's north? Okay. Right. Okay. It's kind of halfway between McIntyre and Wichita Runs. Oh, it's okay. Like okay. We sampled there because that's kind of like the second. Most volume of water coming from the refuge goes to that creek, maybe. Just by looking at it. Yeah. Okay. It's been roughly overflowed. 
So thinking about that back bay curiosity, do we have any slushy, uh, low dynamics for any of these areas? Is that a part? Uh, people are, I think, are working on that right now. Okay. That's definitely, I asked that question a few times, mm -hmm. too. I think all of us did. Um, I think a sediment grain size analysis could help to figure out how, how water is moving through those areas and where it's flowing. Um, but there's people currently working on hydrodynamic models, if I if yeah. you're allowed to say that. <laughs> I don't know how, how far along they are, but what, one of the things that we talked about is using this, this dissolution method. So put out a block of plaster, basically, and then come back and sample it again. And you can sort of see by the dissolution how much wave action, flow, whatever. And then the other thing that, um, that, that she mentioned is this sand grain size analysis, but the, the hydrodynamic modeling would be great. And, you know, of course, the water management district has the best one in the world because they've spent millions of dollars on it, but I don't know that it would cover those back bay areas because of the, um, the, comp the complicated nature of them. They're really good at predicting round passes and stuff where they're um, sort of more, more predictable flows, um, but I would guess the residents find back there that's fine. Or even the, the district, how, what are they using for their inputs? What data, I mean, has, has anybody really done anything? So bathymetry and then um, is the main thing that drives those and, and tide height, elevation. Well, we have so many and inputs and so many flow, outputs. right? So outputs. there's only a limited number of gauged flow stations. So it's just we wanted the same thing. And okay. You need you need more grazing. So what kind of grazing do you need these elements out? Uh, well, I know urchins are, are a big part of the grazing. I know the lab's done past studies on, on urchins and their grazing effects, um, but all kinds of, of invertebrates. I would, I would guess little crabs and, and snails could eat it, but, um, you know, if with high freshwater flows, that affects their abundance, and it can kill off grazers, which then make the algae problem worse. Um, you talked about for, for your study, one of the future directions being, you know, sort of temporal looking, obviously mm -hmm. 4 days in January, you just killed yeah. um, sample size. With any of the other studies that you looked at in some of those other locations, were they able to see seasonal patterns? And I, I think our seasonal pattern might have also likely be influenced by flows. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it seemed like all the studies had different conclusions. Yeah. Like everyone was like, oh, like definitely like the like worst blooms are in the spring. And then someone else was like, like, no, it's in the winter. And I, they seem to find a lot of different things. And I know, I think it varies around here too. And I, I think it, it's related to, to flows, but it, so many things vary from year to year. You know, it could be temperature, it could be flows, you know, a storm that happens and changes this dynamic. So I think it's pretty variable. Mark? What was your original hypothesis? Was that that there would be more algae closer to the river because of the, the nutrients in the fresh water coming out of there. And you would get like a gradient as you moved away from yeah. it. Yeah. And did you just look at a background nutrient concentration like from data that was maybe for a month before around the mouth area versus the back bay area to see if there actually was any kind of difference in the period that those things been no, that would be a good thing to look at. Okay. Yeah. I don't know exactly which data I would use for that yet. <laughs> so uh, the GSDS presented a great uh, talk looking at nitrogen concentrations and flows at F79. And so now we have a curve of loading that's an hourly measurement of flow time concentration. And it matches up pretty well, you know, what you would expect um, so during that time of the year. Probably. There was really low flows and low loading, but the loading was occurring, as you remember, in September and October. Yeah. And this, yeah. the doubling time of 20 days, you know, kind of makes sense. Okay, you turn off flow in mid, late October, and November and December it's growing and doubling. So by the time you get to January, there's, you know, eight times there's 
or more uh, makes sense. Has anybody looked at even just since 2000 when we had a variety of these real off and on flow conditions? I mean, really dramatic. 2000 was a big deposition of of water, and then we went into a drought. 2005. 2013, 2016 would be a high flow year mm -hmm. with different durations, very different durations. It might be interesting to look at the interval of, of the high flow year, look at, at if we know what kind of, maybe we don't have specific biomass, but if we, if we see an overrun of algae in certain years, and if dry years that intersperse with that have a different dynamic, do we do we? Know I think that? I think Erickson and and a, and a colleague from FGCU have started to look at, at things kind of like that over over multiple years using recon data to look at chlorophyll A concentrations in response to flow, and seeing how salinity is decreasing overall over time. Um, who's decreasing? Um, I don't know if if you want to expand on that, but that's the best example that I know of. Of something that's that's being done. We, Rick and and several of us put together that timeline, you know, for the drift algae study, and <clears throat> it's gonna be great to keep that up and keep it going, um, because of, of those sort of longer term patterns that, you know, this may be was a project to help us get started to to really start, you know, doing more often inspections it as an indicator. It seems like it, it's an indicator. It had maybe different results than we expected. But. Mark? We should get like really decent pictures of the dirty one. <laughs> well, uh, did you get one I mean, yeah, yeah, you're, you're shirtless in the boat there, Mark. <laughs> oh, my God. You're just like doing something with a rope yeah. on the boat. Yeah, that's you. You <laughs> get <laughs> on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can ask yeah, go for it. So uh, you mentioned um, a follow-up being the isotope analysis, mm -hmm. and I think this would be um, now taking the science and trying to think about it in terms of policy. Yeah, that's great. very helpful. Yeah, because um, Senator Nelson's been asking for information about the dynamic type mm -hmm. uh, events. And we didn't talk so much about red tide today, but that's yeah. been something that's really been prolonging and recurring more frequently. Um, and we've even had people up at the lake community argue that um, the problems with algae in the lake are coming from our septic tanks. Now, they don't seem to understand that water flows west, not uphill, <laughs> and that our oh, septic up. tanks <laughs> certainly might have an influence on our, our local waters, but they're mm -hmm. not affecting, uh, you know, 15 feet above, above our, our elevation in yeah. the lake. So being able to, to pin down isotope um, sources through isotope analysis, um, I think would also be helpful in us finding the funding to target problems if they're yeah. septic, if they're stormwater, if they're, um, you know, just discharges from natural wetland systems, those kinds of things. I think that yeah, I think that's a really, a really good direction. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the new lab will have the capacity to do those in-house. So that's, that's good. That's positive. There's lots of potential. <laughs> and these, I think these could be really helpful, translate the policy. Thanks for teeing it up. Yeah, well, <laughs> All right.